So I'll, I'll be very brief, and I'm going to take us back up to 30,000 feet uh, and, and talk about where all this that you've heard about tonight fits in uh, and how it fits into what we're, we're doing out, out in the community uh, at UCLA. UCLA, uh, the entire University of California, has a mission statement that we are required to follow, and, and the mission is that we, uh, the, we do research, we educate, and we serve the community. Those are the three things that, that we have to do, and all of our actions have to be explainable uh, in light of those three missions. And one of the reasons that, that our cancer medicine group has led the expansion effort, I'm going to try to show you, we don't think it's possible to, uh, to, to execute the university's mission without doing what we're doing. That is, we can't serve our community and we can't uh, teach and edu educate and we can't do research without, uh, without this effort being successful. So I'm going to, at 30,000 feet, talk about what's going on in oncology and how that applies to what's going on in the clinic and, and where we are in history and, and what we're trying to do. Uh, I, the only thing I'll say about supportive care is that we're pretty much done. We have hair loss still we're working on, but we're pretty much done with the supportive care research to get people through the side effects of traditional cancer treatments. But we are nowhere near done with the much larger issue of how do we support people through the socioeconomic and psychological problems that happen with cancer. It's a devastating disease in, in, in many ways, <clears throat> especially as we make them live longer. And how do we do a better job of keeping them uh, in society and, and fully uh, active? Dennis has done a beautiful job of explaining to you how an old paradigm is crumbling. This is the, uh, where the one-size-fits-all comes from. It was uh, Verkow who organized oncology for the first time and wrote a book that made a convincing argument that at least going forward from 1863, we should think about every cancer that starts in the breast as one disease and every cancer that starts in the colon as another disease. And that worked for about 100 years, and then it, it, it hit... Uh, an asymptote in terms of its ability to support progress. Now, I, I put this up here just for a couple of reasons. One, it's all well and good to talk about uh, we've got a handle on how cancer occurs, uh, and uh, we can uh, dissect cancers and say which pathways are broken in a given cancer. But uh, because we get tens of thousands of answers. If you ask a, an average breast cancer, how many mutations do you have, its reply will be in the tens of millions. And so uh, there is no way, and now we have blockers and, uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, approaches to every one of these pathways. These are normal cell pathways, any one of which might be hijacked by a cancer to make it uh, able to achieve its mission. Uh, not only won't I live to see it, but my, my newborn granddaughter won't live to see the answer to cancer if we do this the old way where we just, by brute force, start pairing drugs one with each other empirically into a clinical trial. That'll take forever. Uh, we're we're going to have to get smarter, and don't let anybody fool you. If this is the really hard part of modern oncology is when you know uh, 60, say, let's keep it simple, different alterations that are present in a cancer cell, which one's the driver? That's where these preclinical large banks of cell lines come in that allow us to kind of load the dice and play unfair with the cancer and, and pick the, 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 the most likely things to work. The, uh, the reason we have to do this, what's the challenge to clinical research, is that if we look for tiny improvements, which is where we were at 15 years ago. Uh, we need thousands of patients in a clinical trial to show that one treatment's better than another. And it, it, we were at the point where a study would be published, every one study, every five or six years in treatment of breast, breast cancer, because that, it took all the patients willing to sign up for a clinical trial in the whole country uh, for five years to answer a question, and then you would see a small difference. Some of those little differences Dennis, has sho Dennis showed you. Uh, if, if I'm a, a fan of going back to history when, when you run into a problem and trying to, to find the answer, 
uh, this, the answer is you look for big effect sizes. If you are looking for a big effect size, you don't need very many people. This is my favorite uh, piece of history. This is the, the, the British uh, um, uh, Navy surgeon who figured out why, uh, why sailors got scurvy. And he went at sea, he, he had six ideas. So he started dividing this, so the, the sailors with scurvy into six groups, and he, he closed down his trial after he'd enrolled 12 seamen and spread them over six groups because it was pretty clear that the two guys that were getting the lime juice got better and everybody else was sick. If you hit it right, if you understand the biology and you hit the bullseye, uh, you, you don't need a lot of patients, and then you can start to see explosive growth where it's not every five years we see one study, it's every year we see 20 studies. And that's how we're gonna make progress in my granddaughter's lifetime or maybe even mine. So uh, to, to, to get away from the breast cancer, some of the things that are, that are happening recently, one of the driver abnormalities that turned out to be important was the a mutation in a gene called BRAF. This is a signal transduction antenna wire uh, uh, a gene that was, that, that was stuck in the on position. And uh, these are waterfall plots, and it just shows you that uh, a disease that until very recently there was no good treatment for metastatic melanoma. If the line is going down, that patient's tumor shrunk. And these, this kind of waterfall plots, you, you never saw with lymphoma, let alone melanoma. So when you hit the bullseye, it can be good. Biology trumps anatomy. That's another take home lesson. Uh, and the, the, I just have three vignettes to show you. These are patients who weren't enrolled in clinical trials, but they benefited from what was going on in clinical trials. So, this is a, uh, a, a young man, the top CT scan, that's a cross-section of the lungs, and anything that in the lung that isn't white, isn't black is bad. And those are, those are tumors. This was anaplastic thyroid cancer, a disease that is uniformly fatal in a very rapid period of time. It's what William Rehnquist died of. Um, and this tumor, we knew, had an activating BRAF mutation just like melanoma, so rather than radiating his throat and giving him chemotherapy, which we knew was the standard of care, we gave him those same drugs that the melanoma patients were getting, and this is the CT scan four weeks later. So it was better to think of him as having melanoma of the thyroid gland rather than to think of him as having, as having uh, 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 anaplastic thyroid cancer. Another, this is a man who had esophageal cancer. The liver uh, is, anything that's black in there is bad. Anything that's grayish is good. The left is before. He had uh, a big esophageal cancer with lots of spots in his liver. But his tumor cells uh, expressed that HER2 gene you heard about and were amplified for it. He was treated with the same chemotherapy those, pre those breast cancer patients got and he's now out three years and we can't find any tumor anywhere. So he is better thought of as having breast cancer of the esophagus and we can, we can skip the, uh, the esophageal uh, treatments that, that are talked about. And now those BRAF mutations are turning up in hairy cell leukemia. This, this makes for a really fast uh, field. Uh, we're, uh, we're now, if anything, we're not depressed all the time in oncology, it's like, uh, living in a shooting gallery because every day something new happens and you have to stay on top of it if you want to do a good job. Uh, another way, a ray of hope, uh, I've told you and Dennis did a much better job of telling you that cancer's complicated <clears throat> and it might be demystified but it's still daunting to think of something that has 80,000 mutations and can figure a way around any block. The immune system uh, uh, is good at adapting. So you, if you want to fight a biological system that's adaptive, you get another biological system that's adaptive that's on your side and turn it loose on this thing. And until recently, this wasn't doing much except in a, in a highly selected group of, of, of patients with, with uh, uncommon kinds of cancer. But the break system on the immune system has re recently been uh, elucidated, and it turns out that there are two places that the brakes can get applied. These are normal things that stop us from rejecting our own bodies. 
that we can interdict. One is at the level of the activation of the immune system, and the other is at the, the immune system being able to kill the tumor cell. It turned out, and we, this should have occurred to somebody a long time ago, that it would be a good idea for cells to pack something that would allow them to turn off the immune system if the immune system attacked them. We want that to happen as long as those cells are normal. But if they're not normal and they have the ability to turn off an immune reaction, immunotherapy isn't going to go anywhere. And these anti-PD-1 therapies are, are doing that. What they're doing is they're, um, they're making the, it impossible for the tumor to turn off the immune attack, and they're starting to show big responses in diseases like lung cancer. So there might be uh, hope on the way. This is just some of the, the stuff that's coming out there. So um, cancer medicine, it's changing the most rapidly it has in, in history uh, through the application of science and technology. And uh, how does that go to our mission? Well, are we supposed to be the ones that are applying this technology? To do that, we need partners and we need uh, uh, we need to be able to deliver the treatments to patients so we can report it and, and get it out there for everybody. And the faster the field's changing, if we're going to provide good service, the more important it is that you have access to a large cassette of the best and most cutting edge clinical trials when you're challenged with cancer. And so that's our challenge is to make that available to the community. community. And the faster a field's changing, the more important it is that we're not just educating our trainees, we have to keep educating ourselves and our doctors. This is a, a, a becoming a, a major issue for us, is just keeping up. And I'll stop there and we'll go to the, the panel. Well, what can you say to all that uh, but wow? Uh, and uh, if there really is a quiz, some of us will be sneaking out the back, but we're going to get to a lot more of the science and uh, some of the treatment coming up in just a moment. Listening to all that really makes you feel fortunate to be living now, especially if you had uh, any experience with uh, cancer treatments even 10, 15 years ago. Uh, the fact that we know so much more today and, and things are advancing so rapidly is, is really encouraging. Of course, the, the whole point of all of the uh, medicine that we've been heard about uh, is to improve the lives of real people. So we wanted to turn to that for a moment and hear a real uh, triumphant survivor's story. Brianna McManama is a breast cancer survivor who's been treated by medical oncologist Dr. Melissa Cohen at UCLA Hematology Oncology Westlake Village. She's had chemotherapy, surgery, and radiation. Brianna and her family live and work here in Thousand Oaks, and she's with us tonight to share her extraordinary journey with world-class medicine right here in the Canaho Valley. Brianna. Hi. Thank you for that great introduction. I am not a public speaker. This is the first time I've spoken to a large group of people. I'm nervous, but I have a story to tell that I think is important. I live and work here in Conejo Valley. I've been married to my husband, Patrick, for four years. In 2011, our family was grieving the loss of two family members, my father to prostate cancer and my mother-in-law to a heart attack. But by August, I was pregnant with our first child and things seemed to be turning around. Then on August 23rd, when I was eight months pregnant, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. I believe I would have found the lump sooner, but my breasts were changing from the pregnancy. I'd always been careful because my grandmother and my great-grandmother both had breast cancer. The diagnosis was stage 3C breast cancer, HER2 positive. That was devastating to me and my husband. We were worried sick about me and about our unborn child. So we had many questions and needed lots of answers. I was lucky to have a doctor who referred me to Dr. Melissa Cohen. She's a UCLA cancer specialist who practices in Westlake and Porter Ranch. Dr. Cohen is talented and a wonderful person. You'll meet her later on this evening. It was really hard for me to tell my mom about the diagnosis. We were still grieving the loss of my father from cancer eight months earlier. But she's my mom, and we couldn't have done it without her. She's been the primary caregiver for my son, Ryan, whenever he needed it, and we needed her a lot. My treatment plan was chemotherapy with Herceptin, a double mastectomy, and then radiation. 
But before I started treatment, I gave birth to our gorgeous son, Ryan, two weeks early. The joy of his birth and having him to love and care for made what was to come more bearable. Only two weeks after Ryan's birth, I set on a trail to beat breast cancer. Except for my surgery, I was able to have all my treatments near my home. And that made such a difference. When you're undergoing radiation and chemotherapy, the last thing you need is a long drive to and from your frequent appointments. I had my last chemotherapy treatment on August 22nd of this year, which was also my fourth wedding anniversary. I cannot say that it has been easy, but it has strengthened our family. We are better, stronger, and happier, believe it or not, <laughs> before the diagnosis happened. We like to hike, and we try to do that as much as possible. And I walked in the breast cancer, the Avon Breast Cancer Walk in 2012, and I plan to do it again in the near future. I am so honored to be speaking after Dr. Dennis Slayman. It's his research into HER2 and Herceptin that made it possible for me to be standing here tonight. Access to quality healthcare saved my life, and it made it possible for some more great news. Dr. Cohen thinks it's time for my husband and I to take back our lives from cancer. So starting in March, we're gonna work on a new little sister or brother for Ryan. Thank you to Dr. Cohen and Dr. Slayman, and thank you to you all.